Hello, Mrs. Lindstrom. Please, won't you sit down? Thank you. Forgive me for keeping you waiting. That's all right. I was so sorry to hear about the death of your husband. On behalf of myself and the entire staff of the Twin Cities Insurance Company, please accept my sincere condolences. Thank you. Now, let's see. <clears throat> I never actually knew your husband, but I'm sure he was a wonderful man. Wonderful. What a pity. Yes. So sudden. Yes, very sudden. Must have been a lot of red tape flying the body home from Venezuela. <laughs> My husband didn't die in Venezuela. Are you sure? No, he died right here in Minneapolis. Didn't your husband work for Intercontinental Petroleum? Lars was a dermatologist. <laughs> Lars? You mean Gerald? Who? Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Lindstrom. I've got the wrong file. Gerald Lindsay. <laughs> That's silly. <laughs> Some days I think I should never have gotten out of bed. <laughs> oh, whatever must you think of me? <laughs> oh, here we are. <laughs> Lars Lindstrom. I never knew your husband very well, but I'm sure he's a <laughs> Mr. Carlson. My husband died over three weeks ago, and as yet I have not received any money from your company. Well, I'm afraid that uh, Lars is not entitled to any death benefits. Well, what does he have to do to qualify? <laughs> well, you see, apparently your husband was having financial problems, and he borrowed against the full cash value of the policy. And you see, a couple of months ago, he failed to meet the premium, and so uh, I'm afraid th there is no insurance. But I, I was counting on that money. That's all I've got. I mean, you don't know. It's not only no insurance. It's... it's oh. What am I doing telling my troubles to a complete stranger? Well, I'm not a complete stranger. We also carry your automobile insurance. <laughs> Besides, uh, I have a great deal of experience in, in dealing with people who have recently suffered a loss. So, so go ahead. Maybe I can give you some counsel. No, really, I, I, I can't. Now, I'm a practical man. My job is finding solutions. So let me help you. Tell me. I have a 16-year-old daughter. Hardly anything left in the bank. I have no job training. My friends have no money. The only family I have is Lars' mother in San Francisco, and she's a widow herself, only recently remarried, and I haven't even met her husband yet. There were a few jewels, but I sold those to pay for the funeral. There's nothing. Nothing. Nothing, nothing. So, Mr. Carlson, what am I to do? Geez, you got me. <laughs> Who makes the law surrounding the Golden Gate simply disappear? Cars play the gangs all here. Phyllis, Phyllis, who charms the crab some fishermen's wharf right out of their shells? Who lights the lamps of Chinatown just by walking in view? Quite near here, I used to watch him building that bridge. 
fact, I was probably one of the first people to ever spit off her. <laughs> Shall I start putting these upstairs? Oh, me? yes, dear. It's the uh, first bedroom on the right. Ah, I guess Jonathan isn't back from the court yet. I'm so nervous about meeting him. I never met a judge before. Oh, they're just like other men. They put on their pants one leg at a time. Except, of course, with those long robes, you can't see if they leave the fly open. <laughs> I think it's a marvelous idea you're moving back to San Francisco. Yes, and this is where Lars and I met. <laughs> oh, isn't life funny? I remember the first time Lars brought you home to dinner. I said to myself, he can't be serious. <laughs> trying to make a point with that story? <laughs> what story? About how I, I was a skinny, awkward, ordinary person. Oh, did you think so, too? <laughs> oh, anyway, I just want to say that you're welcome here, and this is your home as long as you need it. Oh, Audrey, you're so wonderful. You're so good. You're so sweet. You're just like Lars. Oh, Audrey. I miss him so much. The way he used to bring me flowers for no reason at all. The way he used to massage my neck, you know, if I had a headache. The way he used to whistle around the house. From the moment he got up to the moment he went to sleep at night. No matter where he was in the house, you could always hear him whistling. <laughs> How could you stand it? Oh, it drove me crazy. <laughs> oh, Audrey, I miss him so much. Oh, go ahead, dear, let it out. I remember when Lars' father died. Why, the best thing is just to let it out. No. I'm not going to go around feeling sorry for myself and depressing everybody around me. It's not fair. Starting right now, I'm going to be a pleasant, cheerful, amusing person to be with. You'll see. Oh, Jonathan, this is Phyllis. Jonathan! Oh, I've been so looking forward to meeting you. Oh, Audrey told me all about you. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you letting us stay with you. Oh, you know I saw this Marx Brothers movie on television last night. That as a judge, I know you'll appreciate. They're all in court. And Chico says to the witness, what's an animal that's got four legs and a trunk? And Groucho pops up and says, that's irrelevant. And Chico says, that's a right. <laughs> Interesting woman. What's she like when she's not grief stricken? <laughs> I'd be able to find something. Oh, don't worry. I'm beginning to run out of employment agencies. There don't seem to be any jobs left in this entire city. What about that public relations job you saw in this morning's paper? Oh, I wasn't right for that. They're trying to fill their minority quotas. Uh, what they're looking for is a half Oriental, half Mexican gay atheist. <laughs> Oh, yeah. The guests will be here any minute. Oh, which do you think? This or this? <laughs> Phyllis, you don't have to wear black. It's not a wig. Grandma just wanted to give Lars' friends in San Francisco a chance to meet us and pay their respects. Come on. Why don't you try and enjoy yourself? Oh, it's all right, Bess. 
You don't have to console me. I should be consoling you. Now, don't take your hand away. <laughs> Everything's going to be all right, Phyllis. I know. Come on. You should try and have some fun. For everybody's sake. What a wonderful child you are, Beth. I must be a wonderful mother. <laughs> There's someone here I want you to meet. It's your father's second cousin, Louise. Hi. Beth, so nice to meet you. You know I was at your parents' wedding. <laughs> Why do I get the feeling we're all supposed to sing Hello, Dolly? Phyllis! since your wedding. It's so wonderful to see you again. Oh, I'm just sorry it couldn't be under happier circumstances. That's the same thing she said at the wedding. <laughs> I want you to meet Julie Erskine, Julie. Phyllis Lindstrom. Hi. Hello. I'm sorry about Lars. I really liked him. Uh, never mind that, dear. Uh, <laughs> I was just telling Julie what a hard time you were having finding a job. And she tells me that there's an opening in her photography studio. You, you have a photography studio? Yeah, commercial photography. Oh. Would you be interested? Would I be interested? Oh, yes. Oh, I've always had a flair for the aesthetic. I've studied <laughs> painting and uh, ceramics. In fact, my whole life has been devoted to the pursuit of beauty. Then why don't you come down to the studio on Monday? We're shooting an ad for a new roach killer. Isn't she charming? That sounds like a perfect job for me. Is she a relative? Oh, no, no, dear. It's just a girl Lars used to know. In fact, I think he proposed to her once. <laughs> proposed what? <laughs> Marriage. Lars? Proposed to somebody before me? Oh, he, he must have known her long before he knew me. Oh, no, dear. I think he was going out with both of you at the same time. <laughs> oh, at the same time? And he proposed to her before me? Well, I don't know if he proposed to her before you. Well, it couldn't have been after me. I said yes. <laughs> well, there you are. <laughs> My Lars, my my late Lars. What, really? Oh, uh, Phyllis Lindstrom, Reverend Granger, our minister. So nice to meet you, Mrs. Lindstrom. I knew Lars as a boy and as a man, and I always thought he was one of the most generous, considerate, thoughtful, kind, and decent men I'd ever known. Oh, go suck an egg. <laughs> on the whim of another woman. Lars only married me because he couldn't get her. I was his second choice, his, his consolation prize. He wanted Miss America. He had to settle for Miss Runner-Up. He wanted Filet Mignon. He had to settle for... for Hamburger Helper? <laughs> What did you say to the Reverend Granger? I haven't seen him so upset since Elizabeth Taylor converted to Judaism. I'm sorry. I, I know. I behaved terribly down there, Jonathan, but I just found out that Lars was unfaithful to me before he married me. Forgive me, Phyllis, but I don't understand how Lars could be unfaithful to you before he married you. I can understand how he could be unfaithful to you after he married you. I just found out that Lars proposed to someone before me. He wanted a Russian wolfhound and he had to settle for a mutt. <laughs> All right, Audrey. 
Phyllis, I still don't understand why you're so upset. I'm upset because... Because one of the foundations of my life has just been ripped up from underneath me. I'm upset because... Because I finally have a chance at a job, and I can't take it because the woman who offered it to me was involved with Lars. I'm upset because... Because Lars wanted an orchid and had to settle for stinkweed. <laughs> just how Phyllis feels. I mean, in a way, I'm jealous of your first wife. Henrietta? In fact, I'd like to ask you a question, and I'd appreciate it if you would give me an honest answer. If Henrietta was still alive, and the two of us were in the middle of a lake drowning, and you could only save one of us, which would it be? I loved Henrietta, and I love you, too. So how could I choose? I'd just have to let both of you drown. What a beautiful thing to say. <laughs> have a good day, dear. I was married to Lars, I heard that the world of business was a jungle, but I never really appreciated it until today. I spent all day applying for the lowest jobs the city has to offer. Change lady in a laundromat. <laughs> Sales girl in a live bait shop. <laughs> and they didn't hire you. <laughs> me at length about my background. One man stood there holding a live eel and told me I didn't have the personality for the job. <laughs> and that was in the laundromat. Phyllis, why don't you call Julie and tell her you want to apply for that job in the photography studio? Dear. Phyllis, if you don't want that job, you don't have to take it. You shouldn't have to worry about money at a time like this. Why don't you let me lend you a few thousand dollars to tide you over till things straighten out? It'd make me very happy. Jonathan, how wonderful of you to want to help. I just don't know if I could take that much money from you. Oh, it isn't that much. Yes, it is. Well, with Bess's schooling, my own apartment, Clothes, car, we're talking about twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars a year. <laughs> oh, Jonathan, what a nice gesture. <laughs> no, I'm not going to accept your offer. <laughs> I have responsibilities now, and I've just got to learn to handle them myself. I can't go through life like a pampered, spoiled three-year-old. I'm a mature person. It's time I started acting like one. Whatever happened between Lars and that woman, I've got to put it out of my mind. I'm going to get that job. I need that job, and I'm going to get it. Sure I can't change your mind. <laughs> okay, come on. Give me happy. Let me see happy. Come on, happy, happy. No, 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 that's, uh, no, I need happy. Come on. Look, um, you're wearing a royal flea collar. You're, you're happy as a king. Huh? Let me see you. Come on. That's it. Okay, once more. Give me a happy, happy dog. Hey, <laughs> Look, forget happy. Give me glad. <laughs> I'm looking for Julie Erskine. I, 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 there was nobody in the office, so I just came right through. I'm Phyllis Lindstrom. I have an interview with her. Well, she just stepped out for a second. Oh, thank you. Can I help you? I'm Leo Heatherton. 
the photographer. Did you take all of these? Yes. Uh, yes, I did. They're for a restaurant menu. They're very good. Oh. Especially the hamburger. Oh. Well, I uh, backlit the sesame seeds. <laughs> Shot it with a Hasselblad using a four inch lens at five six at one sixtieth of a second and had him hold the ketchup. Really? This is the one I'm most proud of. I call it onion rings. Hi. Hi, Julie. So nice to see you again. Hey, come on into my office. Oh, sure. Hey, Julie. Listen, this dog, I'm. The dog's a lousy model. Did you get me a better one? I tried, but Sybil Shepherd wouldn't wear a flea collar. <laughs> Let me ask you a few questions. Uh, we occasionally work uh, long hours and long weekends. Would that bother you? No, no, not at all. The job pays $150 a week. $150 a week. Would that be all right? Yes, yes. There'd be a lot of running around looking for props and things. Uh, do you drive? Yes, I do. And I love that sort of thing, you know, poking around antique stores, junk shops. Yeah, well, that sounds fine. Uh, any questions you want to ask me? Uh, yes. Did you and Laura sleep together? <laughs> I found out that Lars proposed to you before he proposed to me. So what? Well, I... It means he lied to me. All those years, he told me I was the only woman he had ever loved. And you believed him when he said that? Of course. That's the kind of simple, innocent faith in a man's words that got the Indians the sham. <laughs> I think I'm wasting your time. Phyllis, wait. There's something very dangerous going through my head. I feel this need to fix up your life. You've got a way of doing that to people, don't you? I don't need your help. You don't need help. You need Catherine Coleman. <laughs> Look, I'm about to offer you a job. I'm doing this because I'm an expert on people's abilities. Now, let me tell you something. You are virtually unemployable. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. You're right. <laughs> Julie, I appreciate your offering me this job, but uh, it just wouldn't work out. Why? Because every time I looked at you, I would be reminded of a fact that I, I don't know how to cope with. The fact that I am not Lars' first choice, that, that there was a woman in the world that he would have preferred to marry. So what? Wasn't there any man in the world that you would have preferred to Lars? Of course not. Come on, Phyllis, be honest. Let's suppose, let's just suppose that the very day Lars proposed to you, you were proposed to by uh, Cary Grant, uh, Tyrone Power, Humphrey Bogart, and Clark Gable. Which one would you have chosen? <laughs> well? Wait, I got it narrowed down to Tyrone and Clark. <laughs> Look, I assume that you and Lars had a good life a good marriage, and that you loved each other very much, or else you wouldn't be acting like such a yo-yo. <laughs> what does it matter how you happen to choose each other? All that matters is that you did. You know, you're nice. You, you really are nice. I mean, if, if I'd been Lars, I would have preferred you to me, too. <laughs> Could you still want me for the job? Of course I do. I think you'd be terrific at it. Well, in that case, I'd like $170 a week. <laughs> oh, Julie, uh, I, I promise I'll never bring up the subject again, but I really would like an answer. Did you and Laura sleep together? Look, Phyllis, I went out with the man 40, 50 times. What do you think? I think you didn't. <laughs> <laughs>